Today I'm going to be going over the calculations for the Charlie motor controller design. Um, one of the first things I did was I looked at uh, available MOSFETs. So it just happens that the uh, donor controller, uh, the Robotech uh, heatsink um, that I'm going to be using, the guts of that happen to have some fairly nice um, MOSFETs um, in the, uh, the bridge and there's enough for me to use for this controller. Um, I also have, and so those are the R R IRF B3077s, and I also have some R R IRF B4110s um, as well. So those are a 100 volt uh, MOSFET, and these are, I believe, 75 volt MOSFETs. So the first thing I did was I collected the relevant information that I care about, and you know, that's the RDS on values for die temperature, you know, for, I, I choose 150 C normally for uh, my calculations. This gives me kind of like the worst case um, power dissipation from, for conduction. Um, in reality, your MOSFETs are not typically going to be running at a die temperature 150, but, you know, we're trying to um, calculate out uh, a worst case or you know, uh, an envelope that we want to operate within. Um, some of the other things that we want to look at is what the gate charge is, what the gate source charge is, what the gate to drain uh, charge is. So that is the miller charge, um, the input, input capacitance, the output capacitance, um, the reverse recovery time, the reverse recovery charge, uh, you know, and that we can use to estimate the, the peak uh, reverse recovery current that might be experienced, um, the forward voltage of the internal body diode, um, what the maximum uh, MOSFET die temperature is allowed, so this is on the all on the data sheet specs, what the thermal resistance is from the die to the case, so this is in C per watts. For approximating the switching waveforms for the calculations, um, we can assume that we run in a period from the threshold up to the Miller plateau of um, a constant voltage and that the current is uh, ramping up during that time. And then the second period is from just after the risk recovery or to the end of the Miller plateau, um, we have a constant current with a falling voltage. So these would be approximated as um, uh, a triangular waveform essentially um, over a period of time. And uh, so I think I'm using um, one half um, current, so the, the low current uh, times the bus voltage times the period of time that uh, this is uh, um, transitioning. So that's what we call our turn on time. And so that gives you an energy. And that's the energy consumed during the switching. And this is what we consider hard switching. This energy needs to be multiplied by uh, the frequency that we're operating the bridge at because uh, that will give us the actual average power dissipation for the bridge. Um, for the turn off, it's sort of the, the reverse where we're ramping up our voltage with a constant current and then we're with a constant voltage and uh, a falling ramping down current so exactly the same thing um, use the same formula but with a different time period so this is actually some examples of real switching that was captured in the past so with the um, parameters of the MOSFETs, uh, you can get the RDS on at you know, uh, a higher temperature by going to the data sheet and looking at the normalization um, RDS on t with temperature, die temperature curves. And you just go and either they'll be listed as a, um, normalized or it'll be the actual RDS on, so it depends on the data sheet. So you can just go off and find 150 and then come across and this will then be your multiplier that you would multiply the RDS on at 25C. So going into the MOSFET switching. Now 
you're going to have to figure out how many MOSFETs you need in parallel to, you know, meet your your load requirements. And um, with this design, I've said that I want to be able to operate this at 40 amp continuous forever and ever, and I need to be able to do an overload of 125 amps for 60 seconds. So that's kind of my target design um, that I'm trying for. So going in, you know, using um, the uh, number of parallel MOSFETs to divide down the current so that we have a, a lower current per switch, and using that to calculate what the hard switching values would be for the high side. Um, the low side will have slightly different switching um, losses than the, the high side. Um, the low side is uh, mostly you'll be seeing the, the conductive and reverse recovery losses and uh, that's a lot less than the hard switching of the high side. Um, so this is the formula that I was mentioning that you know where I'm looking at one half the voltage uh, on the bridge times the load current times the on time of or the duration that it takes to go from threshold to fully uh, on and then for the turn off it's one half times the bus voltage times the load current times the time it takes to go from the uh, end of the Miller um, plateau or beginning of the Miller plateau I should say to the threshold and then we multiply, we add those two, the, those two energies together and multiply it by the frequency that we're switching at. Now I've chosen 20 kilohertz for a reason. Um, this seems to be kind of like the, an industry standard thing that was used. Um, and the reason why is that this tends to be above the audible uh, range that most people will hear. So if you switch at a lower frequency, let's say 16 kilohertz, you'll actually hear a buzzing noise and it's kind of annoying. Um, for turn on, turn off times, I'm estimating turn on times of 500 nanoseconds and turn off times about 100 nanoseconds. Um, 500, this, this may be too quick. Um, these things need to be actually tuned when you actually get your, your bridge in because um, there are things about your layout that will affect uh, your operation and you'll need to either slow it down to uh, minimize the effects so these effects would be the uh, gate blip that you get from um, the, the device your low side device that's actually uh, recirculating the the current from the motor when the high side is off when you turn on your high side then you're going to induce uh, a gate blip on the low side and that can cause uh, turn on the MOSFET and cause shoot through to occur. So that's uh, losses that can quickly heat up the MOSFET and blow it out. Um, the other thing you have to look at is the uh, voltage overshoot which is due to the parasitic uh, inductances in the circuit and the faster you try to turn off uh, the MOSFET the higher that uh, voltage overshoot will be and what can happen is you can you can reach a point where you start avalanching the, the MOSFET and then that increases your heating on your your device and then you again you can run into a thermal overload and blow up the device so when you're doing your tuning you need to uh, adjust these turn on turn off times to minimize those two two values so as long as you're below threshold of the MOSFET for the gate blip, then you don't need to slow your turn on time down any further. And for the turn off time, um, like that, that actually impacts a lot of things besides um, thermals on the MOSFET. It actually affects your EMI performance as well. But um, I typically try to, with, with TL220 uh, type packages, target about a 15 volt overshoot and no more. Um, the lower you go, the less noise you're going to have uh, electrically. So let's go over this section. The 
Power MOSFET losses uh, can be divided into two primary components. Your conduction losses, which will be duty cycle dependent, and RDS on dependent and load current dependent, and your switching losses. So the switching losses are proportional to your frequency and proportional to your load current and bus voltage. Your conduction reduction losses are um, proportional to the square of your load current. So obviously the higher you go in your, your load current, the higher your losses are going to be and they can dominate quite quickly. Um, and that, you know, if you draw your curves out, you know, they'll look like an exponential curve um, for low frequency um, inverters or, or motor drives. Um, as you increase that frequency, um, let's say we went up to 200 kilohertz, um, then you would see it, uh, the switching losses would dominate over the conduction losses and it'd be more like a straight line. So with these losses, we can sum up the total power dissipation in the high side MOSFETs and low side MOSFETs. And from that, we can figure out estimates for die temperatures. Because when you're designing it, you're designing to basically maintain your die temperatures below the maximum values. An additional detail is the thermal insulation tape that we're going to be putting between the MOSFETs and the heatsink. So I'm going to be looking at a high flow 300P, which is um, a phase change material with a Kapton uh, backer. And uh, it's a fairly low um, thermal resistive material. And uh, it phase changes at, I believe, 55C. Um, so it doesn't take much to to um, basically have it melt the material to fill in all the gaps and that even reduces your thermal resistance even further. Um, for the size of the TL220 package, the estimated um, uh, thermal resistance of that, uh, that tape material is about 1.37 C per watt. The thermal resistance of the case to junction of the MOSFETs is 0.402, so that's actually really good for, for a device. So as a sum, you know, we're looking at roughly uh, 2C per watt um, to get to the heatsink. The heatsink itself, um, I've gone online and just pulled off something that's similar to the side profile of the, um, the Robotech uh, uh, heatsink extrusion. Um, obviously this is not going to be uh, bang right on, but it's close enough just to kind of give you um, something that's representative of, of you know, the uh, thermal resistance um, for the heatsink. And the, the, what I'm trying to do is to get uh, a design that um, when it's built should be better than what it was calculated out to be so that um, uh, there won't be any surprises. So in the case of this uh, Robotech heatsink, I've actually went off and found something similar here and um, calculated a rough um, thermal resistance of about 3.9 and um, this is uh, assuming no airflow. So with that, that 3.9 and the 2C per watt roughly for the other components and the power dissipation, we can go ahead and run some numbers to figure out what our die temperatures will approximately be um, at the uh, continuous load current of 40 amps. So I've got three MOSFETs in parallel for this, this calculation here. And at three MOSFETs in parallel at 40 amps, it's estimating the, uh, the die temperatures to be about 98 for the, um, the 3077s 
and about 103 for the 4110s. Um, now, that's that's not bad. That's that's pretty good. You know, it means that um, with the the way this is set up, um, that I'm not going to really see probably uh, heat sink temperatures much above 90. So that means I can actually set a threshold for 90C shutdown or fold back and uh, still have pretty decent um, output current. So now if I go to the overload condition, so that's that's actually, um, these are the numbers for the overload condition for 125 amps. So 125 amps, obviously you can't run 125 amps through this continuous forever and ever it would be molten slag by the time you know you really had much runtime on it however what i'm looking for is to be able to run this thing for a brief period of time where let's say you're going up a hill for for like 20 seconds or something like that where you need the extra torque and in that case you know 60 seconds that's not horrible for for a, a period of time and I'm using a, a 30 degree ambient time here so what you end up having to do is this 30 degree ambient is your baseline and everything else gets added on top of that so for calculating out the um, transient time um, what I've made the assumption is and, and this is where real life is not going to be like real life is going to be much better than what I've calculated out here. Um, the assumption is that the heat sink itself is losing no heat anywhere. So all heat that enters the heat sink stays in the heat sink. So now that just makes it a simple calculation to use the specific uh, heat capacity, the mass, and uh, um, the power that's being dissipated in the bridge and from that you know you can calculate out over 60 seconds what that temperature rise will be and then again that's added on to your ambient and um, again the power drop through the uh, tape and the die to uh, case um, thermal resistance those drops also temperature drops get added to this so when you when you add all those numbers together you know at 60 seconds we're looking at dive temperatures of about 153 for the 3077s and that's not bad and you know 170 C for the 4110s so both of these should have no issue running 60 seconds at 125 amp output you know obviously the battery cannot do that. Um, the 125 amps at maybe extremely low duty cycle, um, you could get away with it, but um, once you reach that power limit out of the battery, which is which is the 25 amps at at uh, you know 40, 48, 49 volts, you can't you can't go any higher than that. So that means your current would have to fold back on the output. So if we drop down to two FETs on the overload case, you know, we quickly see that we can't actually stay below the uh, um, maximum die temperature of the data sheet. If I even went down to like 30 seconds. So 30 seconds, I, I basically I could cut it in half. Um, and, uh, you know, two, two FETs would work. Um, if we go to back to our, our 40 amp max, okay, we can see their steady state die temperatures are still within reason. Um, so I, I have a choice. I, I can either um, do two MOSFETs per switch or I can do three MOSFETs per switch. Three MOSFETs per switch will guarantee no issues with uh, the short-term overload um, and it will give uh, basically it'll, it'll make it run a lot cooler for the uh, the bridge so that means I can run in a higher higher ambient uh, temperature if I want to um, because I'm building this and I have 
the, the FETs and I, I don't care about the cost. Um, I'm going to probably stick with the three FETs. And with the three FETs, let's see. So the three FETs should give me um, plenty, plenty of time to get up a hill, <laughs> and you know that that's probably going to add. I don't know um, if you're talking onesies and twosies, it's probably going to add an extra ten bucks to my cost on on the bridge. Um, okay, so that that's that part done. So you could, uh, based on these two devices, you could either use two FETs or you could use three. Um, both will work. Um, three gives you more margin and uh, a longer overload time. So for the caps, the caps, um, the Robotech uh, controller was using um, Panasonic FC series 820 microfarad 63 volt caps. These things have about two and a half amps um, rating at 105 C. So meaning at a lower temperature you can pump more current through these things. Um, but again we just assume when you're doing all your calculations you try to to calculate at the maximum value so that you can um, define your your boundary a lot better. So now that we know what our caps are, I'm, I'm planning to use the caps that came in the in the controller. So that's that's uh, it. Just the reason why is because it's the right height, it fits, and they're actually okay fets or sorry, okay uh, capacitors. So how do we figure out how much capacitance we need? So you can do it. You know, the easiest way to do it is assume all your all your uh, ripple current is going through the caps. Like every, all your current from the load is going through the caps and um, the battery supplying nothing in, in which case uh, you can look at the RMS um, current of a square wave at 50% duty cycle so 50% duty cycle is going to be the worst case scenario for the caps and at 50% duty cycle the RMS current for the uh, load um, at its worst case again is uh, 125 amps um, that's that's 88 uh, amps RMS so that's a lot of caps you know if you actually calculate out you know that's 35 caps um, and it's not practical to do that so when we look at the 40 amp case it's about 28 amps RMS required and that works out to about 11. So, you know, the short term overload, your caps should have enough thermal mass in them to to not cook. And for the continuous case, that's kind of like your bottom um, amount or, or the your your lowest amount of caps you you probably want to use. Um, and that is going to give you the, you know, 11 will give you 28. I only have 10 out of that package, so. You know, 10 is going to be what I end up using. Um, the thing with with capacitors is that the capacitance always falls out. You know, you, you always have more capacitance than you need because you need a lot more um, ripple current uh, capabilities. Why do you need ripple current capabilities? Is because if you try to um, put too much current through caps they'll overheat and vent out and then you end up with a mess so you try to make sure that you have enough um, capacitors or enough ripple current capability uh, on your bridge to deal with um, uh, any extended cabling away from your batteries you know the closer you are to your batteries the less capacitance you end up needing but you know when you're designing a generic controller you don't have control over the the cabling 
So someone could end up putting meters of cabling between the battery and the controller and that ends up being a ton of uh, energy that has to be dealt with. Um, and you know you end up working your capacitors a lot harder as well. So with the capacitance of A200, so that's the 10 um, caps, uh, you end up with a, an estimated three quarters of a volt peak-to-peak uh, -peak ripple. So that, that's fine. You know, it's no, no issue for, for it. Um, so that pretty much does it for the first part. So this gives you the guidelines as to how many FETs you're going to use and how many capacitors you're going to put down. Um, the next part of this is going to be designing the actual um, schematic and trying to get it to a layout and doing the mechanical. So the mechanical is, like I said, taking the, the Robotech heatsink and cutting it down. Now that um, I know that there's going to be three devices per side or per switch, um, I can now size the how much of the extrusion I'm going to keep um, and figure out what parts I'm going to reuse on the whether I'm going to reuse the front plate and put a connector in the same place that they had theirs or make a new front plate for it. So stay tuned and uh, in a few weeks hopefully I'll have another update.